Thanks for coming back this week again, guys. I don't know how people keep coming back. It must be our guest because it's not. It's not us. It's not us. It's got to be the guest. Definitely not us. So. <laughs> the numbers. It's not us. <laughs> we did. We did. We ran the numbers, and apparently, it is not us. But uh, this week, we've got uh, Chris Spangle with us, and Chris is. Yeah. Uh, he's the the local Ryan Seacrest, I think. Man, the guy's got more <laughs> jobs than uh, a Jamaican. He, uh, <laughs> He's he, you're you're now what is your title on the Bob and Tom show? I'm the digital director, so I do the web stuff along with uh Jeff Oske, who's a local comedian. Okay, oh, awesome. okay. You're also you have your own podcast um with a with a libertarian flavor, is that right? Mm -hmm. It's called We Are Libertarians. Okay. And you're also on uh the podcast with Miss Pat. Yep, the Pat Down, the Pat Down Pat. podcast with Miss Pat and Dion Curry. Awesome, awesome. That's cool. So I mean, what do you have any time for yourself in between there at all? More than you'd think. And then yeah. I host the public affairs show on Q95 too. So, and interviewing like nonprofits and stuff. And yeah. the, I, I mostly I'm here all day now. I mean, I'm work from home and, you know, the mornings and afternoons are devoted to Bob and Tom. And then I get the, the late afternoons and evenings to work on other stuff and podcasting and, I probably do three or four podcasts a week of any variety. And then, you know, I drive out to Plainfield where Miss Pat originates. She lives out there. That's where the podcast is. I'm from Plainfield. That's where I grew up and graduated mm -hmm. high school. Um, so nice to be in Hendricks County on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Live and local. Yeah, yeah, nobody's holding the Plainfield part against you at all. As far as I'm going to go ahead and just throw this on. I'm going to throw this on um, Plainfield Shatter. Oh, there Hell you yeah. Go. Okay. Shit, yeah. man. But we'll get some more street cred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe, did you say did you say that uh, he's got more jobs in the Jamaican because of the lemon color? You remember? Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> lemon color. I didn't know if anybody would catch that. I saw that the other, I said that the other day and nobody knew what I was talking about. I was like, uh, you don't remember that? Of course, man. I don't know. Maybe it's because we're older, because we watch different TV than than Craig. <laughs> but <laughs> Probably. I, I had no I clue what you were talking Colors. about. Did you say in Living Color? Living Color, yeah. I remember. Well, I had a skit where he had like 72 jobs or, or whatever, the Jamaican <laughs> guy. I don't remember so, that. So, uh, Chris, how'd you get started? Like, what did you, you know, was that your was that your background or did you fall into it? Or what was the, uh, how do you get started on something? I mean, Bob, Bob and Tom is not a, a small show, right? I mean, that's. No. Yeah, Bob and Tom's, yeah, it's national. It's in 106 markets. I grew up listening to it like. Most people from Indianapolis, I, I've wanted to be in radio and media since I was a kid. I remember, you know, creating my own little newspapers. I had one of those Home Alone Talk Boys hosting my own talk shows. You know, I, I, I've always wanted to go into it, and I always wanted to work for Bob and Tom. I started listening to the tapes and CDs when I was a little kid, way younger than I should have been listening to right. John Fox and Greg Fitzsimmons and some of those other things, but... Um, my dad always listened to it when I would go to work with him or we'd go on trips. It was just always in the car. And so it was always a dream of mine to go into radio and to meet those guys one day. And uh, I went to IEPUI. Um, I truthfully got started, I mean, the Quaker Shaker, Plainfield High School, my high school newspaper, and Mrs. Burris, that was the, the like, that's what really, like, okay, maybe I could do this. And so I went to IEPUI and... Uh, ended up talking to a local radio station about getting an internship. It was 1430 AM at the time. It was a news talk station. And I worked there for four years with a guy named Abdul and then left that job to go work for the Libertarian Party of Indiana and then left that to go work for a marketing agency where I met the graphics guy for Bob and Tom, PJ, who was a Brownsburg native. So PJ Yinger. Uh, and he and I got to talking and what I didn't know is that they had been you know they were wanting to bring somebody on who understood social media and i knew marketing i knew radio i knew all all the different things that they needed at bob and tom i i uh i got a call from pj one day and he goes um uh hey uh tom wants you to meet him can you come down and tell him what 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 you told me i was like uh no, because none of that seemed very nice. <laughs> I want to meet my childhood idol. And yeah. uh, and so I ended up talking to Tom for two and a half hours and started doing some consulting with the show. And in late 2013, they hired me and I've been there ever since. And, you know, Tom, despite his on-air personality, he's one of the genuinely nicest, kindest people you've ever met. He's the 
best boss in the world. And I'm not just saying that. Um, it's been an enormous opportunity for me to learn things like video streaming and video editing and podcasting yeah. and so many different things that I, you know, I was on a walk today just thinking, wow, it's really cool that I got to grow up and do exactly what I wanted to do as a kid. That's and right. That's uh, awesome. th Tom, Tom is a big reason. And then, you know, my mom also, because I lived in my mom's basement for a very long time. Uh, and so it's just pig headed, hard work, discipline, and just meeting the right people at the right time to, yeah. to get into a career like this. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. very cool. That's awesome. Very to be cool. Able to so, do that. so day to day, what's your what's your uh, your your job at like, at Bob and Tom? Like, so give me an average day. Is it is it a lot of behind the scenes? Do you get to banter with the personalities much? Or are you? Oh, yeah, no, know? it's a very small staff. I mean, it's ten yeah. people, and then there's a lot of people kind of in the tentacles of the show and everything that you you meet. Um, right now, it's all weird. Uh, a lot of us are work from home. Um, but your typical day is, you know, there's, there's most of the staff gets there early. There's like half the staff gets there before six Tom's there super early pre preparing the show. And then everybody kind of comes in before six, the on airs are all there. A lot of the producers, the video, you know, Jeff is there switching. And then, then there's another, the other half of us come in between eight and 10, depending on when we wake up. And then, you know, we're there, we're the nine to five crew and uh, I'm part of that. So my day typically was getting there, you know, waking up at six, listening to the show, you know, handling anything online that may need to be handled, getting there, video editing, working with everybody, meetings, you know, what, what are we going to do with this? How can we upgrade this? A lot of infrastructure stuff. And right now it's all very, uh, it, it's all, we're all trying to figure out a new way to work and I can do pretty much everything from here. And so that's what I've been doing. I haven't been in, into work since late March. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's been a total shift and I don't know how long it'll last, but I've adjusted to it. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it is a small staff. So you, you walk in, you joke with Josh and chick and all those guys and, and the lovely Christy Lee and, and Tom says hello to you. And then, yep. you know, you, you work with everybody else. Awesome. That's pretty awesome. So how much head start did you guys get when they said, we're not coming to the studio anymore. We got to work from home. We actually, we started talking about it two or three weeks before government got involved at all. We had several right. events in March that we ended up canceling and we took a lot of, a lot of people were not happy with that, but it turned out to be the right decision because it wasn't going to, the local legalities, the local authorities were not going to allow it anyways. Um, we started to take it seriously. I mean, Tom took it, Tom reads more news than anybody in the world. Like he just, he's, he's his own prep service. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of following it early. And once it kind of, we got word that, Hey, they're thinking about shutting things down or this is very serious. I, I think it was, I'll tell you what it was, I think, and this is for me and for those of us around there, and then also just globally, when Italy shut everything down, and then Joe Rogan had that epidemiologist, Michael, Michael yeah. Osterholm on, Yeah, it was kind of like, oh, this isn't just like Ebola or SARS or MERS or one of these like media driven things like this could actually be significant because you've got China closing their entire economy, costing them trillions, right. you've got Italy, you've got so, you know, we, we just didn't want to put any of our fans or any of us at risk. And, and so, so we started making plans on, we had all kinds of contingency plans. It was, it was a very busy two to three weeks, but we, we were prepared in any way, shape or form. You know, it's funny you say that about uh, seeing Italy or China or, or those sort of things. When I was at work and we were talking and I said, when I knew it was more than just SARS or just a scare or a media thing was when they shut down the NCAA tournament. I know that yeah. sounds goofy, mm -hmm. but you can always kind of follow the money when yep. things happen. Right. And for someone to make a decision that they were going to give up the billions of dollars that comes with that three week tournament, I knew that was, this is, this is the real deal, right? This isn't just, yeah, a, yeah this isn't just something that's going to happen you know, in Asia and we're never going to hear about it or know about it or, or anything like that. So that's have you run into people that still are, are questioning whether it's even a thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah i don't i don't get that either but i, I yeah i'm still trying and chris i don't know where you stand on this but like i'm still trying to wrap my head around those people who <clears throat> don't understand it or say that it's it's a hoax um you know yeah let's just open the economy so it seems odd to me i mean like well it's because you don't want the economy to open anyway you don't want anything to open you just want everybody to still stay at their house <laughs> i do i do enjoy being yeah in my closed little area by myself mm. you know, wait a minute did i hey, did i did i show you guys uh, you know I, admittedly i wasn't wearing face masks because um i if i went out i'll just i it was just a personal decision for me um i kind of am on the edge of uh i want to build up antibodies and i want to uh not you know wash everything away um i don't mind uh the the risk in some level right mm -hmm. in, at some level i didn't start wearing a mask until I, <laughs> one of the i cracked myself up because i think about it it's so stupid right it's really surface but i didn't wear a mask uh, not just from the, the health thing because i didn't want to look like everybody else right everybody else had that, their paper mask and they had all these things and it wasn't until i got my perfect mask that i started wearing a mask all the time you guys see it what, what's your mask yeah. Huh? What's your Did mask? you see it? Look, watch this. <laughs> nah. Oh, I saw that <laughs> online, man. That's awesome. Right? Nice. <laughs> My Darth Vader mask. I love it. I wear this thing everywhere, man. I wear it in the car. I wear it in the house. <laughs> Perfect. Now, oh. Does it have a filter in it? Mm hmm. It has a place you can put a filter in it. That's hilarious. Really? Yeah. Uh. So, so Chris, you're a you're a, the the libertarian, right? You're the work for <laughs> the party libertarian. and all that. So, yeah. what's your what's your stance on that, right? Do, do you go? What's the what's the mix there between personal moral or personal choice and government intervention to say where does this fall in wearing a mask to the the hardware store? Uh, all right, so. There's a bunch of layers to this. I, I was never a person that thought it was a hoax. I never thought that it was anything but serious. My mom is a nurse at Hendrix Regional and was in the ICU. You know, I, you know, I heard this. You know, the non uh, uh, HIPAA stories, and uh, so you know, it it, it was very serious. Uh, and people. And, and, and what I was saying then is the same thing that I'm saying now. It comes down to personal responsibility and everyone making smart choices, not just for themselves, but for everybody else. Right. People right. tend to make rational decisions. And I know that it's, 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 the, it's the hip thing to say that everybody's just stupid and irresponsible, but that's not the case. People don't stop at stop signs because the government tells them to stop at stop signs. They stop because of rational self-interest and they don't want to get killed. Right. So right. people by and large are going to make the right decisions. And so I've never thought that government action of any kind was going to help because what happens when you prohibit something, you make it more tantalizing, you right. create negative feelings towards the thing you're trying to prohibit. You create black markets or unintended consequences. And I think that we saw that through this. You saw uh, why is it that one, you know, you see these towns shutting down and uh, sections in Walmart because you can't sell non-essential items. Well, who's deciding what is and is not essential? Right. So exactly. all, all you're doing is diminishing the amount of money that Walmart can make, which puts more people out of work. Mm -hmm. uh, then you look at the epidemiological difference between what businesses are allowed to stay open or are supposed to close really in terms of traffic and size of store what is the difference between a lobby a, a liquor store and a florist there really isn't any difference it's just that the liquor store has a much better lobbyist than the florist union <laughs> right that's and right so that's true what, what we did is we funneled everybody into one single location in the grocery store you create a hot spot there people people's behaviors were going to change there was always going to be an economic downturn and people were always going to adjust their behavior and change and they were going to stop going to restaurants but i think you would see probably a, a just like it just like at work and just like with the ncaa we started closing events because it was the responsible thing to do we didn't right. do it because the government did it the government only got involved 
once they saw that public opinion would be with them and then they got involved. Mm. And then it the opening took much longer and is still taking a long time to get back to normal because the government wants to test and make sure that the public's with them again. Because at the end of the day, politicians are all cowards and they will only do what helps them get votes. And so I think what you've seen in the public is a shift from my rational self-interest is to stay home, hunker down, see what this is, figure out what the dangers are, adjust to that norm, new normal, and then curtail my behavior accordingly. And over the last couple, two, three weeks, everybody's seen that the danger isn't as severe. The hospitals aren't as overrun. I figured out what I need to do. I'm still going to limit these activities. Yeah. I'm going to go do these activities. But now they can't because the government has really in um, in an unprecedented way in our history right. in, impeded on freedom in a way that is completely inappropriate and ineffective. And so – when I look at what was effective, it was regular citizens doing what was right for them, their family, and their community. What was ineffective was almost all of the government actions throughout all of this. Right. Starting at Trump ignoring the the intelligence warnings, and he bought himself six weeks with shutting the border down with China, and then they did nothing with it. They centralized testing into one location. You know, when, when the CDC and the FDA, there's a great article called The Lost Month by The New York Times where they detail in great detail how the CDC and the FDA completely messed up testing. Every nation that is doing really well with this, like Germany, has a really good testing program. Right. And they were on the ball early. And so what does testing do? It informs the five of us as to how we ought to behave. OK, I'm feeling not feeling well. I've got COVID. I'm going to stay in the house. Yeah. And so populations that could get good testing haven't had the death spikes that we've seen in places like New York City because they had information. Yeah, exactly. So what the CDC did is basically create one point of success or one point of failure, and they completely failed at testing. They didn't allow other labs. So in a free market system, you'd have multiple points of failure or multiple points of success, and you wouldn't have – the kind of uh, top-down failure that that you've seen. So, I I mean, it's not a surprise that the libertarian guy is against government intervention through all of this. But I I don't I don't I'm not I don't believe in top-down control. I don't believe that right. Bill Gates is trying to implant microchips in me and that yeah. he's using vaccines I, to control the world because it's, he's <laughs> ushering in a neo-feudal state. I'm not on that train. And I'm also not right. on the train that the government can really control anybody's behavior at all. Right. It's, it's bottom up, and we are, the, we are the ones who control how society operates. And we've done a, a fine job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the government has right. not. Yeah. You know, it's funny you bring up the whole uh, uh, Bill Gates thing um, and stuff because I think uh, – Joe and I had a conversation about two weeks ago where he, he showed me this company that wants to microchip all their people. And, uh, you know, where are we, you know, I, is that okay? Should we be doing that? And et cetera. And, um, you know, I went biblical, uh, Ricardo can appreciate that, you know, and I said, the, it's the mark of the beast, right? Like you, you, it says it right there, black and white, that it's eventually going to happen. You'll be able to see everywhere, blah, blah, blah. But what I also said was that you have to remember that, when you get shipped, you'll, your doctor will know if you're having a heart attack or a problem, this chip is going to notify your doctor. It's going to help you. It's going to save your life. If you lose your child, right, or somebody kidnaps your child, this chip is going to find that child and bring them back to you, right? And this chip is going to do a lot of great things. So who's not going to want the chip, right? Um, and that's right. but that, it, it, I don't, and so there's a new poll out today that 50% of Fox viewers think that if you get the vaccine, you're going to get a microchip in you. And that's not yeah. what the vaccine. Oh, well, so, that's that. Yeah. yeah so, uh, Why wouldn't they have done that with the flu vaccine? Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there, there's a lot of mis that's been the craziest thing is that if you want the argument for a limited government, that's as close to you as possible, just watch America over the last three, three months. Like, People on all sides have lost their minds completely, and the reality is that what you can control realistically is the 100 people that you come into contact with, the, the inter interchanges that you have with each other, the people that you talk to on a daily basis, the people that you're negotiating with. 
The only thing that the only way to really change society is through peaceful negotiation. You can't force anybody to do anything. And once you try to force somebody to do anything like stay in their house or close their business, then you have problems, you have division, you have a rise in in false information like Bill Gates is going to put a microchip in his vaccine to control us like that's the vaccine that he's creating because quickly vaccines are not money makers for drug companies they don't make money on it by the time they get the vaccine to work the epidemic is over governments are too incompetent to fund or produce a vaccine and so the gates Mm -hmm. foundation stepped in and is producing those vaccines for the common good but russia through disinformation tactics and other nations start sowing that seed of dissent and now you're not gonna nobody's gonna get the vaccine everybody and i'm Craig sees that a lot I'm going to yeah. be skeptical of it, to be to be honest, because you're producing a vaccine in six months. I don't know about that. Um, but the reality is yeah. that if if you – the foundational principle of libertarianism is that you control yourself, you control your own life, and you negotiate with the people that are around you. Mm-hmm. And trying to govern 370 million people is truly ungovernable. There is no president that can actually be president and be effective. And it doesn't matter if Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden were in the White House, they wouldn't be any more or less effective than Donald Trump has been through this because the job is just too big and too unmanageable. And so you need to start returning that to local control. And that's- yeah. uh, I don't that's like the, we talk about local control very much at all. We I should. Know. I mean, now you see how important your governor is, literally life or death in some situations. Yeah. yeah. Your yeah, job depends yeah. on who your governor is right now. Yep, yep. Over who they who they shut down, who they open. We had our guest last week was uh, a uh, Avon Town Councilman, and we were talking to Robert Pope. He's a great guy, uh, former military guy, first Democrat um, in Avon Town history to win a spot on the town council. And he was just talking about um, you know local government and how important it is. And and that's the thing is that. You see at the elections, at the polls, you know, everyone votes for the president and nobody votes for the town council, right? Nobody right. votes for the, the the school board. You know, everyone votes for every four years for the president because that's what gets the, the publicity. And I've always been a firm believer that that, that has so very little impact. It's a, right. it's, it's a different anomaly, I think, with Trump in the White House right now that compared to anybody we've ever had where that does have some effect on you locally but um typically in just my life my life over the last 20 years right no matter who's in office my life you personally yeah household, nothing has changed yeah right nothing my it's business as usual right yeah i'm not sure why and you know the the local officers on uh, the, the the people that we should be voting for are, are people that we know they're in the community right yeah. we know these people and we don't vote and it's just weird to me so chris yeah. why do you think that the the libertarian party or independence in general why can't we crack the two-party system is it just oh. because you can't unring that bell because the two-party system controls who makes the ballot access laws yeah you put yeah. coke and pepsi in charge of who has access right. to the market so rc cola can't break through yeah. because people people have been it's Stockholm syndrome, basically, and and I see I've seen this fear every. Hold on, I got to get my cat out of the shot. Right. Uh, so <laughs> oh, I love the cat. <laughs> yeah. he, every year, every election cycle, I'm told it's the most important election cycle ever, and you can't break out of this this game. You can't if you don't vote for Donald Trump, then Joe Biden's going to get elected, and. Ruth Bader right. Ginsburg is going to pass away, and they're going to elect the most liberal justice yeah. of all time. Right. And you will personally be terrorized by the new liberal justice. Like, has Sotomayor or Elena Kagan really terrorized you? Like, right. I mean, the right. reality is that you are being fed a load of baloney every single election cycle, that this is the most important election cycle, and you have to vote Republican or Democrat, because if you don't, Donald Trump might win again. And then you look at the 80 percent of this country that does not participate in the electoral process it's because nobody is there speaking for them they don't feel that they have a voice and so 
you hear libertarians steal votes from Republicans or from now from Democrats. I'm hearing that for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. The truth is, is that a libertarian candidate activates new voters, people who weren't voting, haven't voted before, or didn't want to vote for one of the other two choices. And so the more that libertarians or independents or third party people start to rise, then you will start to see those parties do better. But it depends on voters standing up for themselves and saying, I'm tired of getting the same crap. Like you really have to ask yourself if you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you're a Republican, for instance, because we're in Hendricks County and one year they canceled the primaries because no Democrat showed up uh, to, to run for office. Uh, if you're a Republican right now, you have to ask yourself, how did we just add $3 trillion to our deficit? I thought we were budget hawks. I thought we were better than this. Well, they're not. And when George W. Bush was president, they increased the federal deficit. And then when Barack, but then when Barack Obama is in office, we need to be worried about the deficit. But when our guy's in office, we don't worry about the deficit. Right. It's it's that idea that you have to stay in this camp or else is really just a fear tactic to keep power for themselves because they're lying to you. Donald Trump breaks almost all of his promises and says one thing and does another. He's defunding who, but they're still paying the World Health Organization because Congress has to authorize it. And so you, you have to ask yourself, what am I really getting for my vote for Republicans or Democrats? And, and listen, as a libertarian, I voted since I when I was a Republican, I never voted. I prided myself on never voting for anybody but Republicans. Mm -hmm. And when I became a Libertarian Party person in 2008, every election cycle, I've cast my ballot for Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians and Independents every single cycle because I've become more independent minded. And, you know, there's a lot of libertarians who don't consider me a good libertarian. Like, it, it, and it's because you become more independent when you start thinking for yourselves and stop outsourcing your thinking to politicians who just want to take advantage of you. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you on some of those, those points too, because um, during this last election, I did not vote for uh, either major candidate. <clears throat> and uh, I was told I gave my vote to Trump. I gave my vote to Sure. It didn't matter who I spoke to, you know, whether they were Republican yeah. or Democrat. I was an ass. I gave my vote <laughs> to somebody else. Like they would tell me flat out, you either gave it to Hillary, you gave it to Trump. And As if they own your vote. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the <laughs> psychology in that is twisted and weird. Nobody owns my vote. Exactly. A vote is your First Amendment right to speak right. what you believe as a citizen. It, it is not owned by a political party. And straight ticket voting should be completely abolished in this state because when you walk in and you just press the party button, you're giving power to politicians that control you instead of actually caring about what you believe. Oh Eric God. Holcomb, the governor. That is the truth. It, <laughs> Eric Holcomb is making decisions based on how the newspaper will report on him and what the money deletes in the state will – how they'll donate to him – and what other politicians will think of him, he doesn't really care what many voters think because they don't really affect him because he knows he can do whatever he wants. You're going to still show up and vote Republican, and he's still going to win. And that's the sickness of the two-party system is that you lose control when you completely give your vote over lockstep with straight ticket voting and with party politics. You get politicians who no longer care about your voice. You know, I, I, we at my job, I we interviewed a, a gal. It's been three or four years ago, and she was a um, aide or an assistant to a um, state representative. And we, you know, we were very interested. We want to hear about what she was doing in her job. And she said that her guy happened to be a Democrat. And she said he's a gun guy. He's very much a Second Amendment enthusiast you know he supports the constitution he's he has all these kind of conservative views she said but he has to go out there and say what the democratic platform is or he has to say what his constituents what will get him the votes for the democratic party because of where he lives and what he what he represents and i thought man that is this is awful that that it is you know i get it that the republicans will if you're a republican in hendricks county and trump says something you have to defend it. You have to back it up. I, I get that to some degree, but I hate that that an elected official feels like they have to say certain things, even if it's against their own personal moral code yeah. or their own personal beliefs, 
because that's the political party's line. Remember when I said politicians are all cowards and they're not actually yeah. leading and the government <laughs> is not actually quarantining you for your own good. They're only doing it because they felt that the population was with them and now the population's against them. And so they're opening up mm-hmm. like we are in charge. We're the ones who are in charge, not them. Where right. we, what, how we vote, how we spend our dollars, where we show up, where we don't show up. You can open your business tomorrow. If you're closed right now, open your business. Because the best act of civil disobedience through all of this was the woman in Texas who stood up, opened her business, looked in the judge and said, throw me in jail. I don't care. Come at me. And mm-hmm. she stirred up enough people that all of a sudden the governor yeah. went, oh, I'm, I'm scared. I got to make sure that I open up because I want right. to look good. And right. so right. The, the majority of people who are in office are decent people. It's just that we have, as voters, allowed tribalistic thinking to remove agency from those people. And so now they can outsource everything to the party, to the mindset, to the ideology, to what Vox says or what National Review says or what Reason says, like to what the, I, the intellectuals think. And when you no longer hold people accountable for things – then it's easier for them to just do whatever they want and then blame. It's not my, it's not my responsibility. It's not my choice. I'm just have to do this. It's what's And you see that throughout history. You, you, there's a great documentary that's kind of disturbing called one child policy mm-hmm. in China about the one child policy and the bureaucrats in that repeatedly say, I didn't want to do it, but what choice did I have? I was just following orders. Right. And, we have an administrative state here and things are not as gruesome as they are in China or in, in other places, but we still have the same psychology. Bureaucracy outsources everything and, and it's cruel and it's horrible. And so government isn't empathetic. Government is very uncaring. Call the IRS right now with your problems. Let's see how, right. how empathetic and loving they are to you with you and your problems. They don't care. But Even call the Democrats. A, yeah, call a private charity, and I, I bet you'll get help. You know what I mean? And so yeah. what I want to build is a world where people take care of the ones that they love, and they have the freedom to do that. They have more of their money. We don't have this parasitic organ that takes 40% of our dollars. Think of how much more good you could do in the world if you had 40% of your paycheck. Yeah. You know, And that is the right. libertarian message is that you – are intelligent. You are responsible. You should be in control. Your neighbors are by and large the same. And so you should have the freedom to do that. And when government tries to help, it applies the rules unevenly and effectively and cruelly. And it's not compassionate. It's actually very, it's just heartless, you know? And so uh, I I don't want to come across as saying that all politicians are evil people because they're not. I talk to a lot of them. They're well-meaning, decent people. They're just cowards. And the best way to get what you want from a coward is to stand up to them and say, I'm sorry, stop bullying me. Stop telling me my business is closed. I want to go back to work. And they go, okay. You know, and so, and it doesn't matter if you're a liberal or a Republican or a libertarian or whatever. The, the reality is that if you actually use your voice to to go to politicians and say, this is what I want. They'll start listening. It's just that most people have checked out. They've stopped caring. Chris, I want to have you on the show at least once a month. (laughs) (laughs) First, but like I could see Tony on that screen there. It looked like he got the Holy ghost for the first time earlier. (laughs) I don't want to say it too much though. So, but I, I totally agree with you. I believe that we need three parties in this country. I've said this a thousand times. In addition, um, my personal view is that we, we, you know, when we elect these officials, they go to Washington, they buy these houses ridiculously. Um, they're paying for all this. Where I think that if if they're ours officials, right, we're sending them there. We should have that house for them, right? So we, as the state, this is your house. This is the house you're going to live in um, during your time here. This is the car you're going to drive. Like, I feel like they got a lot of freedom to do whatever they want, and and uh, like they forget that they work for us and um that's been a a huge challenge in my mind um and again i think it's because they they win and they don't need this anymore well uh, yes and no like i think todd young who spends a lot of time here in the state really does care about his constituents and like you know there there are they do care it's just that they have more and more to care about 
And so the problem with an administrative state or a bureaucratic state like we're building is several different outcomes. The more you ask them to do, the less effective they can be at it because there's a limited amount of money. And everybody wants more of their tax dollars back. I don't care what the polls say, maybe from the left saying, I'm willing to pay more taxes. No, you're not. And so there's less there's less effectiveness when you start saying, we're going to regulate this. We're going to control this. We're going to be responsible for watching this. What you end up is a person who's underpaid showing up to inspect the beef, looking around going, looks good to me. I've got to get back to what I was doing because I've got 5 million things I've got to do today. And so then you get less effective regulation instead of because you've really removed any consequences, right? And it's the same for politicians. So we decided that we shouldn't have the Tammany Halls and the boss tweeds and, and the old party politics where the party's picking the presidential candidates and the local machines are going. And, you know, Thomas Taggart was the mayor from Indianapolis in 1900, and he was the Democratic Party boss in the state. And he got so wealthy that he bought a, a Hyannis Port house next door to Joe Kennedy and the Kennedy clan and the Taggart clan were family friends, right? So yeah. if you go to Riverside Park and there's that arch, that's the Taggart arch. And it's a monument to a party boss. Well, somewhere along the way, we said, we don't want that type of system. We want politicians to have more power and independence. And what we've done is we've now made the job of a congressman picking up the phone dialing for dollars because they now have to raise so much money every single day, like $10,000 a day to stay in office. Yeah. Because if they aren't in office, the party is just going to pick somebody else. So now you've completely eroded the incentive to actually, you, you just jam packed their day for with fundraising instead of governing. Right. And, and yeah. so they do care. It's just that they have such huge responsibility to fundraise. And the thing is, is that most of these guys, like Todd Rakita, when he was a congressman, when he went to Washington, D.C., he was your congressman. He was – he I probably shouldn't say this, but he was sleeping in his office, which <laughs> most of those young freshman congressmen sleep in their office and shower in the, in the congressional gym because it's very expensive to have a house in Washington, D.C. and in their district. It's why Evan Bayh yeah. and Dick Luger kind of just magically disappeared, didn't have houses in the Indiana anymore, right? And so, you know, when, when Dick Luger used to come back to town, he'd stay at the Adams Mark out by the airport. He didn't have a house here in Indiana and, and, because it's just too expensive. But then it's, if you're there a long time, like Charlie Rangel or Bernie Sanders leave with three houses, right? Because you get – you use the social proof of being a congressman or a senator – to sell a bunch of books, charge for speeches, you get think tank dollars, like all of a sudden you you get to a certain level and you become rich because now you you're super influential, you cash out, you're like Evan By now working in as a lobbyist in Washington DC. So th the power eventually becomes a gateway to money. And so money is just at the core of all of this because at the end of the day, why is money and power the most important thing for these congressmen? It's because when you centralize force, because this is the fundamental difference between libertarians and everybody else. Government is force. It's really hard for me to sit here and persuade the four of you of my way of thinking. It's way easier if I go pass a law and force you to do what I want you to do. Right. And so, but then once I want you to do what I want you to do, you have to organize against me and we have to have a fight and then everything becomes divisive and awful mm -hmm. because we're using force to solve our problems. And then we get in trouble with our communities and police officers and have that fight because we're asking our police officers to do too much because without the police officers, a politician is just a guy with a bad opinion. Mm -hmm. It's the police <laughs> that enforce all of their laws. So the system that we are building that we are continually voting in with Republicans and Democrats doesn't work. It doesn't work for the individuals who are serving in office. It doesn't work for the citizen. It doesn't work for the police officer. It doesn't work. So why are we continuing to do it? Yeah. yeah. So are you a, are you Chris, are you a taxationist theft guy? Yeah. I mean, fundamentally um, you, when the morality it doesn't change when you start voting on taking my money, right? right. So if the four of you form a, a government and vote to take my car, but you give me a bicycle in return, you're still stealing my car, 
right? right. You know, the, the morality for me does not change. A big reason why I'm a libertarian is that because I want to be treated the way that I treat others. It's the golden rule. Mm -hmm. And so I don't believe that just because we've gotten together and have decided that, oh, we're going to vote on taking this from you to put it to you somewhere else that the morality doesn't change for me. So yeah, I mean, at fundamentally taxation is taking money from me to redistribute it to somewhere else in society. And, you know, the, there was a big discussion about Bill Gates should pay more taxes because Bernie Sanders had a plan out for, for Medicare for all. And it would, it would require Bill Gates to have 9 billion less dollars. Do you, maybe Craig doesn't, but do you, <laughs> feel more confident confident in Bill Gates having that $9 billion now to develop vaccines, or do you feel more confident in Donald Trump and the CDC having that $9 billion? Right. And that's where I go, my tax dollars are better decided by me, your tax dollars are better decided by you, and we'll solve society's problems together because at the end of the day, empathy really does rule society. Mm -hmm. It just gets eroded when we start dividing ourselves into all these different warring factions. That's what's eroding empathy. It's the divisive nature of where we are right now. The landscape yeah. is a very divisive landscape. So I don't see much empathy at all. Yeah, right. Yep. So, so what do you say to the fallacy, though, uh, that – that the argument I always hear for against libertarianism is is what you said is that kind of that the that the that people are genuinely good people right we want what's best for everyone but what do you say to the fact that for it to work right everyone has to do the right thing mm -hmm. that if you if you take away some of the regulations and the the the, the things that that government intervenes in. Um, then what stops Craig from dumping all of his sewage into the retention pond, right? What stops um, the guy, the, the, the meat farmer from putting out good meat or just slopping, you know, some horse in there and calling it grade a and putting a sticker on it and selling it. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, what, what Bad prevents that if there aren't those regulations? Yeah. The, but the problem with governing by that cliche, uh -huh is that bad actors still exist. And so I always, what I always like to do is take that, take that what I consider a cliche or that story right. and examine if that's happening now in society. When we have the greatest expanse of federal, state, and local government that we've ever had in American history, because the most growth-oriented period of this country was between the Civil War and World War I. Right. And that was unfettered capitalism and the robber barons are taking over and there were legitimate problems with people like Carnegie taking advantage of his employees. But we managed to work that stuff out, you know, because labor unions negotiated with that private employer to, to work those things out. You know, maybe they used guns sometimes, but, uh, but the reality is that uh, bad actors will always exist. It doesn't matter what system you create. Somebody somewhere is going to do something stupid or illegal or wrong, right? So let's look at it through the lens of the pandemic. It, it doesn't matter that we had really through March the most aggressive public affairs campaign in, in American history to educate people on their choices. Mittens, get out of here. Uh, you, you had everybody in society knew about coronavirus, what was going on. Now, as politics and the opening have come into play, we're more confused as to what the facts are. But in March, we really all kind of understood, wash your hands, stay six feet, sanitize this. You need right. to stay at home. Don't go yeah. out to a restaurant. Don't do this. Were there people who still did that? Yeah, absolutely. There were still people that were going to go out on March 17th to St. Patrick's Day. So right. Right. local municipalities felt that they needed to shut down. Well, what was the effect of the shutdown? What was the effect of the prohibition, the government intervention? I saw in my timeline a shift from everybody stay inside, do the right thing, and protect your grandparents to I need to protect my liberty from these people who abuse me constantly. I need to oppose this instead of talking right. about that. I need to fight this. I need to, and it became completely divisive to the point now that mm -hmm. we can't get it together again. Like if there's a second wave, just forget it. Like, 
They're, they're, we're not the we're not the people we were in March, right? Right. And so, were there people who were going to go out and walk around? Yeah, absolutely. But guess what? After you shut everything down and you passed all the regulations and you and you encroached in human freedom in a way that has not happened in America, the line at Bob Evans on Easter was incredibly long the parking lot was full people were not six feet away from each other they're going to do what they're going to do and they have to suffer consequences and the problem fundamentally with our society is that you've removed the incentive to be a good actor because you've removed the consequences of things and so if people no longer face consequences for their actions and we try to protect them from outcomes then you get more bad actors and so we're, we're kind of seeing that right now. Like if you run a restaurant or if you run a janitorial service, you're having a really hard time staffing because right. people are making $18 an hour on unemployment and they don't want to go back and work for $8 an hour, or $12 an hour. And so you've yeah. removed the incentive to, to go back to work. And so what are the consequences? The consequences are not going to be suffered by the federal government and the legislators that made this law. The consequences are not going to be suffered by the people who are choosing not to work. The consequences are going to be suffered by the small business owner who can't provide good service, who's going to go out of business. Right. And so when we all decide we can't afford to keep you on unemployment and paying you $600 a week, you're not going to have a job to go back to. And so when things break down, it's never man A, who is the lawmaker who's passing the law that suffers the consequences, or man C, it's man B in the middle, the forgotten man. You've read Am Amity Schley's book. It's the person who didn't have any involvement in the choices, but the intervention directly affects. They're the ones who suffer the consequences. And that's why when you go through hard economic times, it's the middle class that tend to be the most riotous and not, right. the, not right. the poor because they've always been poor, not the rich. They're going to be fine. It's the people who have lost their business because the government decided to make things worse. Now, if you're unemployed, that's $600 a week. I get why they did it because right. you want that money to be spent, right? You want the money to be circulating. You want to stimulate the economy. The short-term effects of giving people $2,400 a month on unemployment is better than them having no dollars a month, right? On the overall economy. Now the long-term effects on that are that you're probably going to cause more unemployment and you're probably going to cause more inflation and you're going to cause a faster default on our federal credit. Uh, and so there's, there's, there's consequences for that stuff, but nobody's going to, nobody's thinking about those consequences because we're just trying to save everybody from, from everything. So to get back to your question, things like global warming, for instance, right? I, I just remember seeing like five years ago, Johnson and Johnson promoting the fact that they had become, become green, a greener company, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't do that because of any laws. They did it because it was the right thing to do, and they want to show off that it, they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the NCAA didn't shut down because the government told them to. They did it because it was the right thing. Most right. people do the right thing. There will be bad actors, but it's going to happen. You're going to create more bad actors with prohibition than if you just persuade them because if people make the right choice because they've got the best information, they're more likely to be good actors than to become bad actors. Right. So, so how does a guy who is this intent and this dedicated to the Libertarian Party get into a podcast with Miss Pat? How does that happen? <laughs> like that is because we've listened to some of that and we we saw her on Joe Rogan and she's hilarious and and she is hilarious. She, she is. is she is just great. She's and so what is the connection between a hardcore Libertarian like Chris Spangle and Miss Pat? Well, Miss Pat and I both had a weight issue. Okay. Some might argue that we still do. <laughs> but we we bonded over the years. I've lost about 70 pounds. She's lost probably far more. She she looks great. But like years ago when she would come in, we just would like, hey, you look great. You're losing weight. I'm losing weight. You know, we, we kind of connected on that. We'd chit chat a little bit when she came into Bob and Tom. And then uh, late... 2018 she's like i'm thinking about starting a podcast what equipment do i need how do i do that uh right. so we started talking about it and then she went out to la and talked to joe rogan and he's like you have to have a podcast 
podcast. And, yeah. and when you do, you can come on my podcast. So she she called me. She's like, hey, white boy, I need you to come set this up. <laughs> and so I went out there. I had a conversation with her. And uh, I was I just thought I was going out to roll tape for her and on her first podcast. And she was like, do you want to be my co-host? I was like, what? <laughs> um, awesome. And it's really to Miss Pat's credit because Miss Pat is – Miss Pat is a liberal. She's a Democrat. Uh-huh. Dion, the co-host, my co-host, Dion Curry, he's a socialist. He's a self-avowed socialist. Uh, I am a libertarian who grew up in the town. I grew up in Plainfield. She lives in Plainfield. And Miss Pat came from the middle of inner city Atlanta, didn't have any exposure to white people in a significant way until she moved to Plainfield. And then she was right. like, holy cow. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, I graduated in 2002 and I, I told her I, I don't remember having anybody who was black in my class. It was, yeah. you know, but my brother and her son were best friends in high school, which we didn't know till like episode five or six. And she came to my house for my brother's graduation, uh, you know, and so I, I don't. I just remember my I thinking, wow, my family's getting so progressive right now. Uh, we're just so it. But so I've had run ins with her over time, but it works because I don't know anything about black culture and it has been a great learning experience for me to have conversations, you know, basically about racial reconciliation, but having some of the I've never laughed harder than I've laughed when we're doing that show. You know, and I think for Dion and Miss Pat, it's kind of made them see a little insight into the way that I grew up and the way in the place that she lives and why, you know, why, why do white people think about certain, she, she said one time that she, she saw somebody when she was growing up who said, uh, you know, the American dream for the black family is owning a home. The American dream for a white family is owning a McDonald's, you know, and we've talked about that particular statement, like what goes into that psychology? What did he mean? Is that true? Like, and they're, you know, I come from an entrepreneurial family, you know, and it is a mindset where freedom is owning your own business. Freedom is not working for anybody. Freedom is being debt free, right? you know, and what is my version of freedom? What is my version of how politics in the world looks compared to the way that her world, you know, like there's things that I love about Miss Pat's family and her culture that I'll never look at the way I grew up the same, like suburban America is so individualistic. It is, we put the we build back porches instead of front porches. You walk into your house, you don't come out, you don't really know your neighbors, you're completely isolated right. now. Yeah. You're talking to people in groups that look like you, think like you, talk like you. And Miss Pat's family is communal. It is if you are I am part of the family now, whether they like it or not, yeah. you know? And they're that's cool. They're her approach to the pandemic was different than mine. I'm going, oh, the economy. And she's like, It'll be fine. You you know, like, you know, so there's just all these differences between my culture and her culture. But once we get down to it, we, we have the same motivations. Dion is a socialist who wants Medicare for all. I am a libertarian who doesn't want government medicine at all. But our, our, our goal is the same is for people to get the best health care possible in the cheapest way to be, to be healthy, to be secure we just have different paths to get there, you know? And so what we've been able to do through that show is to find that common ground and learn to love each other and appreciate each other, even though we have big fundamental differences, it seems like, but we really don't. We're at the end of the day, even if we're of different cultures, we, we have the same impulses, feelings, emotions, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's been truly a remarkable experience. It's been a fun experience and she is just, it's to her credit that she had somebody on that isn't in, you know, her, her tribe or culture or whatever, but that conflict so-called conflict, I think has been great, but it's, it's incumbent on me to listen. It's, it's part of me to be open to the discussion and it's on them to be open to discussion too. We approach it with friendship first and understanding second and then our differences, you know? And so what's the uh, great podcast. What's the most absurd thing that white people do that Miss Pat was just shocked about? Like, if you come across something where she was just like, 
And I know that's very, you know, stereotypical, you know, that every comedian does that, but, but <laughs> what was, what was the one real thing that she just couldn't believe growing up that, that, that you guys did? Uh, I don't know that there was, so she, when she first got here, she thought that corn was grass. <laughs> oh, really? She was the like, corn fields? like the- yeah, yeah. Just totally shocked. She, she was mostly shocked by like how secluded it was. I think like, yeah. Yeah. you know, where, where she lived and grew up, it was, you know, everybody's outside, everybody's talking. It's very communal. It's, and then you yeah. come here and it's very isolated, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, I, I think that is something that suburban culture needs to change and can learn from, you know, getting to know that's been a great part of diversifying my life is understanding that the way that I grew up, was not necessarily healthy to my mental health. I right. need to have more community. And it yeah. took this podcast to teach it. But uh, so I think that maybe was, you know, that and and how bland the culture is. So she calls us uh, what she called. She called me the Mayo devil. <laughs> think of <laughs> Mountain Dew yeah. baby. I'm not sure. But there's, it's just very bland here. You know, it's not not, you know, it's Plainfield's just a Chili's and and a Coles. And you know, there's not a lot of it's very generic. Right. Yeah. If you really want to spice it up, you got to go to Coachman, you know? Right. (laughs) And you have somebody like Ricardo. Ricardo's from like Brazil. Right. And, um, you know, I I grew up in in the U.S., but I grew up outside Philly. And uh, I I, I dealt with a lot of people, and I'm happy like living out here where nobody bothers me. Right. Right. Uh, Right. My neighbors, you know, but Ricardo lives up the street from me, and he'll come walking down, and he feels very open to, cross the street in the middle of a pandemic to like want to talk to me and we yeah. joke around about that um yeah, yeah he, never... he doesn't realize he's a social terrorist knocking on your door unannounced <laughs> at least drop a text in or something yeah yeah like w- what are you doing what are you doing and i'm over here like you need to stay across the street by the way does <laughs> is ricardo just the uh, the sound guy or does he talk in this podcast he hasn't said one word i have I to raise my hand to talk yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what is it in in Brazil, Ricardo? Is it more like Miss Pat, or is it more? It really like is. I mean, we're, we're very friendly people, right? So, but you know, I've lived all over the, the the United States. I lived in New York for five years, in Boston, and L.A., San Francisco area, up in San Jose. So I've seen all different types of people, you know, uh, and it's I, I can appreciate it from everywhere. And then, and then there's Michigan. I think everybody mm-hmm. in Michigan is crazy. You know. Yeah, <laughs> I do find it interesting though when when you were just talking about um, you know people wanting to uh, get together with differences, right, and just talk yeah. and just understand each other. And I find that it's really difficult to I, like. I genuinely think that people don't want to do that. Like, yeah, times that we've gone on on social media and somebody's arguing about something petty, you know, it's like why don't we just go have coffee? Why don't we just talk about it? Yeah, uh, and just really kind of get some perspectives and things like that. But, Nobody would ever take me up on that, right? People Nobody don't. Uh, and, up on, on, on being able to sit and have those conversations. Yeah, what, and what Dion has said repeatedly, and I think he's right, is that white people in general and people who are doing well of any color don't want to be uncomfortable. And that's mm-hmm. part of what the pandemic has done is it has made people uncomfortable. And so that right. economic anxiety that people felt in March or are feeling now for the first time that is how a lot of people of minority status or in the lower incomes of our country feel all the time. And they're always uncomfortable. You know, my my co-host on We Are Libertarians is black. His name is Harry. And Harry was the first person to help me realize that every time he leaves the house, he doesn't know if he's coming right. back. Right. And a police stop for him is life yeah. or death, where I have only recently had an incident where reaching for my registration caused the police officer to pull back and unholster his gun. Well, that, that was uncomfortable and scary, but that's something yeah. that, you know, Dion or Harry or Miss Pat, they live with every day. I don't have to live with that. There are differences. And it doesn't mean that if you accept that there are different experiences in this country, you don't become an AOC socialist loving libtard. Like right. you, you can appreciate right. that, we have differences. There are different experiences. Some people have different levels of comfort than others. And how can we negotiate that so everybody can be more comfortable? Yeah. But it may mean having conversations 
initially that make you uncomfortable. I was extremely, you go back and listen to some of those first episodes of the Pat Down, where it's mostly a comedy podcast. It's like 10% this kind of conversation and 90% right. comedy. But when we had these conversations early on, I was terrified of saying something racist. I didn't want to go out there and be Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. and, I'm <laughs> um, uh, Google Joe Biden today if you don't know what he said. Oh, man. Okay, I love hard. that comment. It was real bad. And, yeah. you know, but that's the type of thing where you don't, if you're white, you don't want to say something that's going to make people uncomfortable. Like most white people don't. They, they don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable. So they don't want to have the conversation because they've probably had an experience where someone who is a minority jumped down their throat because they said the wrong thing. Yeah. And yep. that is where I think Dion has, has learned over the course of these conversations. I need to be more empathetic and like, you know, I was at Miss Pat's house the other day and they had bonnets on and I'm like, I'm going to be honest. I don't know why you're wearing what's the bonnet for. Cause yeah. I don't understand black hair. Right, and they're right. not mad at me for asking that question because we're <laughs> friends and they understand I'm not, I'm ignorant because I don't know. I'm not ignorant because I don't want to know. Right. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, if you reach out and have conversations about the differences that our cultures have, people don't get mad at that good intent. They get mad when you just don't care. Like the Aubrey shooting in Georgia, trying to find a reason why this, these two guys weren't at fault seeking out the reason is the thing that ticks people off instead of just going, that's a, you know, like it, it's, I, I just look at it and I, I'm a, I'm a more open person diversity has always been important to me, but it's more important because I've seen the way that diversity over the last two or three years has expanded my life to yeah. make it more full, to understand people that have different experiences than me. Cause I grew up in a 99% white town. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I'm a, I am a teacher at the uh, IUPUI and I see the diversity there is great, you know, and you get to experience people from all over the world. And I think it's just, you know, it, it's, it's great to be there and, uh, and have that, interaction with all different types of people yeah. Oh, yeah i mean i grew up i would turn 18 two days before 9 11 so like i oh, turned yeah. 18 on 9 9 uh -huh. signed up for the selective service on 9 10 and crap my pants on 9 11 yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah <laughs> and what i saw because the two percent it was 98 percent white and two percent minority and that two percent is muslim because of isna they're in in Plainfield oh, yeah. and two of my best friends were Muslims. And I saw people that knew them their entire lives over the next couple months, start yeah. treating them differently Oh yeah, and treating them, you know, one of my best friends who's best friends with these two guys, like, you know, they have nuclear weapons in the basement of that place, right? That oh, mosque has, I'm like, are you out of your mind? You know, like <laughs> the head of Isna's at the white house right now with George Bush, Mr. Saeed. So, uh, you know, that was, and one of those guys, Musa Saeed went on to, he teaches at Harvard. Now he is a filmmaker who made all these great movies about the Muslim experience around the world and right. is a great filmmaker from NYU. And I, I just like, I was more empathetic towards the Muslim experience after 9-11 and through those wars because I had Muslim friends in high school. Right. And it makes you moderate a lot when you start reaching out to people that are different than you, you know? And so I, I just would encourage, and, and I don't just mean that as like skin Still color. Like, yeah. Like right. if you're a raging liberal, have a conversation with a MAGA Trump hat. Like that's what's going to save this country. What's going to save this country is having conversations like this yeah. with people that you don't agree with. Yeah. Right. You know, it's it, you. You brought up the the not knowing um, how how they felt when they left the house and what you know white people for the first time are feeling what they think is oppression. You know, um, I had a, a, a she happens to be black friend of mine send me a video that was of these. Um, stay at home white moms in Idaho who all decided at the same time to take all their kids to the park and violate the park was shut down rules and the police show up and they're like, you know, I'm watching it through these lens of, of seeing these police who are asking politely for these women to leave. And these women just are just flabbergasted that someone would be telling them what to do. And finally this lady just tells him no. And they put handcuffs on her. And so my black friend is, is commenting on the video and she says, have you ever seen a black person be put in handcuffs and their friend get to walk up and hand them a bottle of water and take a drink, <laughs> oh, right? Because oh, no. one Karen is in handcuffs and the other Karen is like, here, honey. And she's giving her a drink while she's in handcuffs, <laughs> right? And they're like, 
you know, can you believe this is going on? And they're like, we're going to film this. And I'm like, this is what it's like for Tony to leave the house every day. This is what it's like for, for the average black person in Chicago every single day. It's it, and, and, and my, my friend that's in the video is cracking up because she's going, what, this is the first time that this lady's ever seen anybody in handcuffs before. Yeah. Like know? the kid in Georgia who walked through the construction site, you know, how yeah. the video of how many people walked through that construction site was released. You know, yeah. he was just walking through a construction site. Like yeah. the other dozen people that were walking through that construction yeah. site. Yep. And, and the sad part is that if you go and look at the comments on the video of the discussion we're having now, there's going to be somebody who is trying to pull you back into the broken tribalistic thinking of whatever side they're on. Yep. And they're going to try and shame you for listening to this conversation. I'm not listening to you guys because you're all flaming liberals or whatever. Right, you know, right. or there'll be somebody from the left having that same, why would you have a libertarian on? Because he doesn't understand this. Yep. And what we all have to do is give less of a crap about what that person thinks and more of a crap about what the person we don't totally understand thinks. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, we just have to start caring, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so if you don't agree with a MAGA Republican, go have dinner with one. If you don't right. agree with an AOC supporter, don't don't crap talk their post. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse here. Send them a message and invite them out to dinner. Like, hey, I don't agree with you. I want to have a conversation with you. Yeah. You want to change the world for it to be a better place, for it to be less divisive, for it to be less awful. Make a different choice because the millions of different choices that you can make will start changing the culture. It will change society for the better because remember what I said, we're bottom up. It's not top down. Well, it, things are not going to change until Donald Trump's out of office and he changes. Things are not going to change until Barack Obama stops poking. Re no, it, it, forget them. They're irrelevant. They don't matter. You matter. Your neighbor matters. Those are the people you need to talk to. You have to start doing work. And I'm sorry, you don't just don't have the luxury to be lazy and be comfortable and be like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just going to go sit in my house and veg and watch TV and rot my brain. Like the world is such a rich, full place yeah. once you stop ignoring what it is. Yeah. And it's, the, the, I, you know, I think the I, problem, I, the problem I, I run into is when you try to talk to those people, uh, um, sometimes they're so far right or so far left that it, you can't even have a conversation with them. <laughs> yeah. You just got to connect yeah. on what you can connect on. Right. I always start with pedophiles. We all agree. <laughs> we all hate pedophiles. Yeah, agree we all on that one. like them. Right. We love start puppies. There. We hate pedophiles. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, we're, Carol Baskin we're, killed her husband. That's right. <laughs> Carol Baskin definitely killed her husband. So I think, you know, Chris, I think we're going to wrap up. We're, we're over our time, but man, we didn't want to stop you. I mean, things are, uh, the, you know, you hit a lot of points and, and, you know, to kind of summarize there at the end, I think that's what we're trying to do a little bit. Um, the curmudgeons we're, we're, we're all, I mean, obviously you can look at us and say, these guys just on the surface are all different, but we have that common thread of being, yeah. Avon dads, um, you know, of being, you know, guys that care about our community and, and, and help exactly. out, you know, Tony's done all the police videos. Craig is involved in, in youth activities and sports. Ricardo is a teacher. I work at a nonprofit that employs people with disabilities. I mean, that's what we do, right. Is we're trying, right. I think I'm looking at this zoom video and I've got this little bitty box here and that's all I can control, right. I can't, I can't mute you. I can't reach over and touch you in the video, any of that. I can only control what I can control. And I think that if you look at it, metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking, our four boxes together are, are one great big box. Right. And if we can just reach out and just touch a little bit, you know, uh, I don't think we're ever going to change the world, but if we can change our neighborhood a little bit um, and, and have people like you on and, and, and guests that can, you know, kind of lead that, that discussion. We Absolutely. Love it, right? just think about the, the movie, big fish. It's a great movie. Watch it. And that's the movie it, ever. Yeah, and at the end, he's being carrying his dad out to drop him into the river, and there's the hundred people around him in his life. Like, that is your life. You know, opt out of the media hysteria. Opt out of caring yeah. about what the media tells you you're supposed to care about. Opt out of the bad ideas that are keeping you locked in division and start caring about those hundred people in, in a really clear way. And before you know it, we're going to end up more free. We're going to end up more prosperous. We're going to end up in a less divisive, less angry society 
but it's dependent on every single person listening and watching to this for that to happen. That is true. Wow. I've, ne I've never applauded so many times on <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, these podcasts because it, it just, there's so many truths that ring oh, yeah. loud and clear uh, when it comes to communal um, uh, togetherness. And I, and I really appreciate your perspective for sure. Yeah. Um, and this is probably the longest we've ever gone because it really has been very interesting. So oh, yeah. I hope that the viewers, I'm not really on Facebook too much. Um, so I don't know what's going on there, but I really hope that some of the viewers get the opportunity to just really kind of think about uh, mm -hmm. where we are together uh, in this, in this uh, town. And uh, hopefully we can start to come together and just have conversations around, and it doesn't have to be around politics or anything like that necessarily, but just, right. uh, just having conversations, right? Like what we're doing now. So yeah. I do appreciate you. I know the rest of the, the promotions appreciate yes. you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's, it's been great. Yeah. yeah, appreciate Thank it. you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Yep. All right, yeah. You guys stay safe and we'll talk again. Yep. Appreciate okay. it. We'll see you guys. See you, Chris. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you too. All Take right. care, bro. Bye. All right. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Take care.